1979, Alien was unleashed on the world and struck terror into the hearts of starry-eyed moviegoers who had been charmed by the uplifting atmospheres of sci-fi blockbusters like Star Wars and Superman the Movie. Making over 100 million on a modest budget of 11 million, the film was both a massive critical and commercial success, and 40 years later, is still regarded as one of the greatest achievements in the realm of science fiction. Thanks to an immaculate visual style from one of the greatest visual directors in the industry, Ridley Scott, and his cinematographer, Derek Van Lint, a top-tier cast of actors the likes of Sigourney Weaver, Tom Skerritt, John Hurt, and Ian Holm, the inventive and tightly paced script by writers Dan O'Bannon and Ronald Shusett, an oppressive and claustrophobic setting created by the cramped industrial sets of production designers Ron Cobb and Michael Seymour, and one of the most terrifying and memorable creature designs in film history, courtesy of artist H.R. Giger. Because of these things, the film went from a B-movie concept and pitch to being the very film that is synonymous with the genre of sci-fi horror. Not bad for an idea that initially started out as a campy student film that would then receive a bolstered creative team through a failed adaptation of Frank Herbert's Dune. But in spite of all that, one question remains. Is the film still scary? Now, I am a person who has seen dozens, if not hundreds, of horror movies, and I rarely get scared by them. So the answer in my case would be no. But what is considered scary is an incredibly subjective topic. A better question to ask would be, is it still effective? Which is a question that could be answered in far more detail, which is exactly what I intend to do here. I will be covering the 2003 director's cut, which is my personal favorite version of the movie for reasons I'll get into later. This should go without saying, but there will be spoilers. So if for some reason you've gone your entire life without actually ever seeing this movie, I do not recommend watching the rest of this video until you've corrected that mistake. Seriously, watch it. It's a fantastic movie. Also, if you're a person who has seen this film, but hasn't seen it in a while, it might be a good idea to re-watch it. As I'll be going over a lot of different scenes in vastly different parts of the movie with not much context provided. So refreshing your memory of all the stuff that happens might make for a less confusing experience. This is the warning. And the point in the video for you to pause and watch the film. Okay? Okay. Let's get started. One last disclaimer I want to give is that I will not be analyzing the famous chestburster scene. Because out of all the scenes in the film, it is the one where I legitimately cannot add any new information or perspective on. Everything about this scene, from its pacing to its technical execution, has been covered in explicit detail by dozens of videos and documentaries before this one. It's that simple. So moving on. In my honest opinion, the greatest asset this film has is its cinematography and visual style, courtesy of both director Ridley Scott and cinematographer Derek Van Lint. I'm pretty sure that I don't need to tell you that Alien is one of the most beautifully shot sci-fi films of all time. The film's use of atmospheric, unnatural low-key lighting and intense contrast gives it such a sharp, refined look that it makes it look like it could have been released today rather than in 1979. It's all the more impressive considering just how hard it was to achieve the lighting the filmmakers wanted for most of the film. Most of Alien was shot on anamorphic lenses, which gave most of the shots a very wide aspect ratio in order for the viewer to see as much of the ship in each shot as possible. This created problems for Scott and Van Lint, since the sets and sound stages for the Nostromo were so cramped and the camera was so wide and big in relation to the sets and corridors that make up the Nostromo's interiors. Additionally, the process of lighting each scene was also made much harder due to the cramped nature of the production design. It became so hard to hide and disguise the lights they needed to use that Scott and Van Lint had to find ways to fit their lights into the scenes diegetically, meaning they had to decorate them to visually fit into the film's world and set design. The production had another vital element that took time to adjust to, 
Ridley Scott himself. Scott is universally known by film buffs and even other filmmakers as being responsible for some of the most visually beautiful films ever made. The issue is that making films that look as good as Alien or Blade Runner or Legend or Gladiator comes at a grave cost. Scott's methods for achieving visual brilliance are clever and inspired, but they take a very long time. One example being the cryopod in the film's ending shot. Scott was so particular about the level of moisture on Ripley's cryopod being a certain level that he waited a whole six hours for it to accumulate in a way that pleased him. For filming a shot that was only about 10 seconds in length, in the commentary, screenwriter Dan O'Bannon said that before filming on any of the sets, Scott would first walk through them with an incense candle and cake the sets with smoke. He would then fan the smoke in every possible direction with a piece of cardboard and wait a good hour or two for the smoke to settle and dissipate to a very specific degree which would give each and every set a very thick, heavy, and almost choking quality to the air that not only gave the film's atmosphere a more hands-on feeling for the actors, but made the film's lighting contrast visually pop more through the lens of the camera. This deliberate, zen-like, perfectionist approach to Ridley Scott's craft was the source of a lot of arguments between him and the producers at 20th Century Fox who thought that he was taking too long to shoot the movie. But the results really do speak for themselves, especially as far as the film's lighting goes. The lighting also contributes to one of the recurring visual motifs this film has that plays a big part in making it such an effective horror film. What is this motif? Well, it's basically the universe of the film itself. Scott went out of his way to portray the world of this film as not only huge and vast, but physically imposing. The amount of shots in this film in which the human characters are dwarfed by the sheer immensity of either the human or alien structures is too numerous to ignore. Look at the opening shots of the ore refinery. Look at the shot of the Nostromo landing on the planet. Look at the legs of the Nostromo in relation to the characters exiting out of the airlock. Look at this shot of the derelict and this eerie as fuck shot of the fossilized engineer. <coughs> I mean, space jockey. The sheer amount of shots in this film featuring gigantic, looming, black shadowed objects paints this as not an ideal or adventurous world of the future, but as an angry, malevolent, and cold one. The fact that most of these shots utilize low angles also communicates the immense size and weight of these objects and psychologically makes them look quite intimidating. This dark visual style combined with the consistently huge scale is one of the film's most memorable aspects and almost feels gothic at times with both the Nostromo and the space jockey derelict's lighting giving off the feeling of a dimly lit cathedral or dungeon. It even applies to how the characters are filmed in a couple of instances. Look at this shot when Ripley crosses over from one side of the frame to the other. The presence of all of this massive machinery being filmed in such intense black shadows and low angles brings to mind the great monolith from 2001 A Space Odyssey, a film which Alien owes a lot of its inspiration to. The purpose of this visual style is not only to make the viewers perpetually uneasy as they follow the characters, but it also creates the perfect stylistic smokescreen for the movie's titular creature itself, which is also a gigantic looming black color object. The Nostromo's sheer industrial immensity and the abundance of heavily shadowed objects and bulkheads provides the perfect environment for the xenomorph to hide in plain sight. Part of the genius of Giger's visual design for the creature is its black, obsidian textured exoskeleton that allows it to blend in with the obnoxious, darkly lit infrastructure of the Nostromo's interiors. Nowhere is this more evident than the death scene of the Nostromo's technician, Brett, played by Harry Dean Stanton. This scene has a specific shot that is exclusive to the director's cut that I really wish was included in the theatrical cut. Whenever Brett enters the massive hangar with the water raining down from the ceiling, he takes a moment to douse himself in the water, during which we get this shot. With the benefit of hindsight, it's pretty easy to tell that this strange object dangling among the chains and bulkheads suspended from the ceiling is in fact the alien 
with its body curled up so to be visually indistinct from all the objects around it. However, if you saw this film for the first time, not knowing anything about it or the xenomorph creature itself, I seriously doubt you would know that this random object is in fact the creature until the moment where it swoops down behind Brett and takes his life. The swiftness in which the creature kills Brett would have your mind racing to piece together what exactly it looked like in that previous shot. This shot is just long enough to realize that this thing dangling there is not like the others, but it's also just short enough to where you don't get a real good look at it. That feeling of the audience member trying to remember what the creature looked like, that's exactly the type of participation you want from someone watching a film like this. Leaving this shot out of the theatrical version was a mistake, and it's one of the prime reasons why I prefer the director's cut. Whenever people watch this film and talk about how they feel the alien could pop up anywhere at any time, this is what they mean. It's because of how Scott utilizes the aforementioned repeating visual motif, or image system, as filmmakers call it. Scott's use of this specific image system creates a hostile and physically domineering world for the audience to transport themselves to, which harbors an even more hostile and physically domineering monster that could be hiding in any shadows and among any object or device. There's another system that Scott cleverly uses to make the cinematography evolve along with the escalating tension and suspense of the story. Throughout the entire first half of the film, Scott and his DP, Derek Van Lint, make very frequent use of wide shots and master shots in relation to how they film the dialogue scenes between the Nostromo crew members. What is a master shot, you may ask? Well, to put it as simply as possible, master shots are typically wide or long shots that capture all the dialogue and or action of a scene in one unbroken take. Typically, when a director and his crew begin to film a scene, the master shot is the very first shot that is captured, because the master shot will be the shot that the director and the DP refer to in order to keep the continuity as pristine as possible with all the close-ups, reactions, and all the other shot coverage they plan to do after the master. Alien, in its first act, relies heavily on the use of master shots. Close-up shots are very scarce. You will rarely see a single Nostromo crew member alone in one shot during the film's first act. I believe this was done for one very big reason. It visually communicates to the audience that the Nostromo crew are very friendly and comfortable with each other. That they very much have a certain unity to them, which will be challenged later on in the film. This sense of comfort and warmth puts the viewer in a serene mental condition before shit starts hitting the fan. Very much a calm before the storm type of intent. In fact, most of the film's major scare scenes are preceded by a very slow, cozy, and quiet atmosphere, adhering very closely to that intent. There is one scene in the film's first act that completely breaks the flow of the wide and master shot usage and does it brilliantly, which is the scene where John Hurt's character, Kane, finally awakens after his encounter with the facehugger. There's one shot in particular I want to discuss, which is this one. I remember some horrible dream about smothering and... Anyway, where are we? Right here. Have you ever watched this scene in the movie and felt like there was something very off about this shot in particular? Well, there's a very good reason for that. In photography, there's this thing called the rule of thirds. In a nutshell, it states that when you're filming a person's head, you typically want the back of their head in either the far left or right side of the frame and leave a lot of negative space in the direction that they're facing. Their head is placed in one third of the shot, hence the name, the rule of thirds. Now, looking at this close-up of John Hurt again, after listening to what I just told you, you probably piece together that this shot breaks the rule of thirds, because all the negative space in the shot is behind John Hurt's head, and his face is right next to the far right edge of the frame. Why did this happen? Is Ridley Scott a hack? Well, no, not at all. At least not as far as this film is concerned. The rule of thirds, you see, is not really so much a rule, but a guideline. And it, like all the other so-called rules of filmmaking, can be broken by filmmakers who know what they're doing. 
The rule of thirds was implemented simply to make the audience's viewing experience more comfortable. It's more visually pleasant for subjects in a shot to have a lot of looking room. Having the edge of the shot right next to their face makes the shot look very cramped and uncomfortable, which in the context of this part of the movie's story is exactly what Ridley Scott was going for, since in the next scene, this happens. <laughs> Also, remember how I said earlier that before this point, the film rarely ever used close-ups of the characters? Well, this scene is almost nothing but close-ups. The more laid-back feeling of unity that the film previously had is mostly lost with this scene. The constant montage of close-ups in this scene is very intense and uncomfortable, considering that this is supposed to be a happy scene where everyone is joking around and bonding with Kane over his strange predicament. The way this scene is edited reminds me a lot of the dinner scene from the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which may sound like a long stretch to some people, but hear me out. This scene also makes heavy use of back-to-back close-ups where we see the Sawyer family laughing and having a good time in stark contrast with the female lead who's tied to a chair and scared out of her mind. I wouldn't really consider this comparison to be much of a stretch since Ridley Scott is a big fan of the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre and cited it as an inspiration for the horror in Alien. Whether the Texas Chainsaw similarities in this scene are intentional or not, I do genuinely feel like this scene is directed in a way to make the audience uncomfortable and tense in order to adequately prepare them for what comes next. From the chestburster scene onward, the film pulls the camera much further in on the characters, making much heavier use of close-ups and even wider shots showing only a single character. That sense of unity I mentioned earlier is now crumbling away. In fact, not only are there fewer shots where the characters are bunched up together, but there are even a few shots where some characters appear larger or smaller in size than others. There's no better example of a shot like this than in the scene where Ripley officially takes charge of the Nostromo crew and forms a plan to get rid of the Xenomorph once and for all. Watch this clip very carefully. Can we trust, trust I'm not going in these drawers. I'm for killing that goddamn thing right now. Okay. Well, let's talk about killing it. We know it's Stop. using the air shafts. Will you listen to me, Parker? Shut up! Let's hear it. If you ask most people what they love about this moment so much, many of them will respond about how good Sigourney Weaver's acting is, or how powerful of a moment this is for Ripley as a character. Which are all valid reasons to be certain, but the main one for me is how this moment is framed. This exact side profile close-up of Ripley is set up well at the beginning of this scene. For this moment, we cut back to it as Ripley loses her composure and screams her head off at Parker in order to make him listen to her. Notice how Ripley's head is in the foreground and in focus, and Parker's entire body is in the background out of focus. Ripley's head in this shot is the same size as Parker's entire body, making her appear domineering and physically imposing against Parker's smaller silhouette. This shot composition gives her emotional outburst more power and more impact. It visually communicates the idea and the catharsis that Ripley has officially assumed control of the ship, and that everyone should listen to her now. This is masterful film direction. It gets the point across in a strong and effective manner. It's not preachy or trying to make a cringy pro-woman political statement, unlike a lot of modern films I could name. It's just one character effectively getting through to another in a superbly directed manner. But I think we've spent enough time talking about the scenes with the people. We're talking about how the film remains effective as a horror film, so... I think it's about time we talked about the film's namesake, the big chap himself. At this point, I think it's important to acknowledge something that might not sit well with the more snobbish cinephiles who enjoy Alien. If my Texas Chainsaw Massacre comparison earlier wasn't indication enough, it's undeniable that Alien owes a lot to slasher movies. While definitely not a pure slasher movie, there are big similarities with the isolated environment, the characters being stalked and picked off one by one by a mysterious killer, the final girl. But whereas slasher movies are memorable because of the creative brutality of their death scenes, Alien takes a different approach with its kills. Rather than being about gory spectacle, 
though that is certainly present, the death scenes in Alien make their impression through diverse filmmaking techniques that present suspense and tension through all the new information they convey about the creature itself. The chestburster scene was a massive contraption that took a lot of time in rehearsal. The initial reveal of the creature's adult form as it murders Brett involved some top-notch stunt work and cinematography as mentioned before. And the scene in which the creature kills both Lambert and Parker involves some really clever editing, with the shot of the alien's tail coiling around Lambert's leg being taken from Brett's death scene, as shown here. as well as some really inventive sound design, as Lambert dies an unspeakable death at the alien's hands. <laughs> this is all great stuff, but to me, there is no other scene in the film where all of the elements of filmmaking congeal more than the famous air duct scene. This scene is the film's finest moment of mise-en-scene. The best scene where the cinematography, editing, performances, production design, sound design, music, and more all work in perfect synchronicity to create what is one of the finest suspenseful set pieces in film history. And to really piece together why it works so well, I think it needs to be analyzed thoroughly from start to finish. One thing I find kind of funny is how anytime you see a shot of one of the vent junctions being sealed by a metal aperture, the focus shifts. The reason I find this amusing is that the very process of focus shifting involves the use of a similar aperture inside the film camera itself. So in a very humorous meta sense, you could say that the movie itself has come alive and is literally trying to kill Dallas. The recurring image system with the more numerous close-ups is utilized for most of the shots outside of the vent. We see numerous back-to-back close-ups of Ripley, Parker, Ash, and Lambert, which helps keeps the audience on edge. Another nice bit of cinematography I want to highlight is this real tight shot where Dallas moves towards the camera and the fire from his flamethrower illuminates the foreground, giving off a very hellish look. Nice touch. The constant beeping of the motion tracker is also a brilliant bit of art and sound design. The beeping noise it makes sounds like a pacemaker or some other unpleasantly loud piece of medical equipment. Also the fact that the alien is represented on the motion tracker's display as a moving white dot makes me think of a white blood cell coming to repel a foreign invader. It makes this entire vent system that Dallas is trapped in feel less like a man-made structure and more like he's inside the belly of some horrific beast. This idea is reinforced by a very special piece of set design. Mad props to the YouTuber Rob Ager and his Collative Learning channel for actually pointing out this detail in this particular scene. I cannot take credit for it. In this shot with Dallas, there are some silver cone-shaped objects mounted on the walls on either side of him. Now if you freeze this shot and turn it 90 degrees, now what does it look like? If you still don't see it, let me help you. Yes, it's the alien's mouth. It's unmistakable. There are even separate rows of cones in the back that look similar to the creature's inner mouth. There's no way this was a coincidence. This had to have been a deliberate placement by Michael Seymour or Ron Cobb, and it drives home the idea that the Nostromo is now officially the Xenomorph's domain. Another aspect of this film that I have yet to give any praise for is the excellent score provided by one of the all-time great film composers, Jerry Goldsmith. This scene in my eyes is where the score really shines as it carries the suspense and momentum of the scene even while not much is happening on screen. My favorite moment would have to be the heavy strings that play at the very end that keep the viewer's attention diverted as Dallas descends the ladder and then suddenly... 
You're welcome, Five Nights at Freddy's. So, in conclusion, that's pretty much all I wanted to say about Alien. It's a personal favorite of mine, and I hope I helped you learn a thing or two about the hands-on aspects of filmmaking with this video. I could have gone over a lot more stuff, but I want this video to be more of a companion piece to the movie and not a step-by-step -step breakdown of every bit of filmmaking minutia that it displays. I do want you folks to watch these films and make your own observations, after all. I do highly recommend checking out the YouTuber Rob Ager and his Collative Learning channel, as he has some of the finest film analysis videos that have ever been made on the internet. His methods for analyzing filmmaking have been a huge influence on me, and considering the numerous videos he's made on Alien, I hope that mine has at least been close to his standards. I'll share a link to his channel in the description. But yeah, Alien is a great film, and if you made it to the end of this video and still haven't seen it, then you are doing a huge disservice to yourself. It's actually my favorite film out of the trilogy. Yes, I said trilogy. There are only three Alien films, no others exist. If you try to convince me otherwise, I'll just think you're crazy. So with that being said, we have reached the end of this chapter, everyone. The next video will be based around the character who is this one's arch nemesis, so I will see you then. Be well, my lovely viewers, stay safe in these strife-filled times, and remember, in space, no one can hear you click the like and subscribe button. This is F.W. Waller, signing off.